It is such a delight to be home. Uh, this is always, I, when, when we, you know, are here, it really feels as if we know you all. <laughs> you know, uh, it's uh, uh, such a joy to partner with this church because this church is also partnering with us as City Changes as we impact nations across the world. As a matter of fact, we just had somebody from Spain in the first service who uh, is in, uh, plays a role in all the publishing of Christian material within Spain that connects with us now in our City Changes engagement. And um, uh, this week, just this, this past week, we had the privilege of just having a partner gathering for those that are in the U.S. connecting with us and, of course, uh, Pastor Verge was there, and we had various sessions, and then we had a team-building exercise where uh, we had a whole group of these people go fishing, and uh, we had a competition. And I am here to announce some good news. Guess who was the winner of the competition? Hey! hey. <laughs> Just look at, the, look at the size of that thing. I mean, it, it's like Jonah and the whale is like. <laughs> but I have to show you how this happened. So we have some real life footage. Just look how he, look at the style. Just, 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 just look. <laughs> yeah, and then the final victory moment, just as, uh, as we brought this on the boat. Look at that. Uh, of course, this is fantastic, but I was also on the boat. And so let me show you what I caught. Here I am. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> he caught the fish, I caught the salad. <laughs> so we, uh, it was so much fun. And of course, you know, um, uh, privileged today to speak about the good news. And this is so indicative of it, right? I mean, uh, this is all good news for pa Pastor Verge. For me, it's just news. <laughs> you, you see... Um, it's important that you understand when you speak about the concept of the good news that you discover yourself in the good news. The good news has to have bearing on your own life. Um, and of course, good news is only good news if it is good news. Right? Any measure of bad news that you infuse into the news can change it from being good news. And sometimes when I listen to people communicate about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it really does not sound like good news. But this is the essence of the gospel is the fact that it is good news news and that it includes every one of us you see we must discover ourselves in the story yeah. I'm always amazed at Paul when he writes to the Roman church he's actually writing to them to unpack the story of the good news it's the most comprehensive communication about the gospel in the when you read the book of Romans and when he starts, he says, I'm speaking to you the gospel of God. You see, it's important to understand that God took the initiative in the story. Sometimes we think we still have to convince God. You know, kind of ha you know, have this, this engagement with God so that somehow if we can convince him, he will save us. No. God took the initiative. He started this good news story. And then he writes, as he writes about the gospel, he says, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the key. 
Jesus unlocks our understanding of what the good news is all about. But then at the end of Romans, he finishes off this letter to the Roman church and he says, I'm reminding you of my gospel. Suddenly Paul sees himself in the story. This story has a bearing on my life. I am included in this reference. And that's in essence what makes this good news good news. We often speak about the good news, the gospel story, as the story of salvation. Now, salvation literally means to be able to deliver people from harm or from ruin or from loss. Saving, saving someone. And if we use that term as Christ followers, what are we really talking about? And so today I want to talk to you about our understanding of the good news of salvation. Um, when the Bible uses this term salvation, it's interesting that it is used in three different tenses and in three different senses. It's fascinating that the Bible would speak about the fact that we have been saved. That's a past tense reference. But the Bible also speaks about us being saved. It's a present tense reference. And then the Bible speaks about the fact that we will be saved, which is future tense. And so today I'd like to communicate to you the, the wonder of this salvation, this good news story, and its progressive engagement in our lives. And that we recognize every one of these moments and dimensions is part of the good news story. So, um, the fact is, when we think about these three concepts, have been saved, it's really speaking about what happens in our identity. When we become new creations in Christ. When it speaks about being saved, it's speaking about our maturity, how we are growing into the fullness of who we actually now are, our identity. And then when it speaks about we will be saved, it's this future hope that we live for, recognizing that in the final analysis, we will be transformed to be as he is, which is eternity. And so to understand salvation, to understand the good news story, you really have to grapple deeply with these three concepts, identity, maturity, and eternity. Now, here's what's very important, and this is where the, one of the elements of the good news is established. The fact is, many times people struggle with their maturity. They make mistakes. They, they let themselves and other people down and, and, and they feel, well, I didn't quite measure up to be a good Christian person. And, and because they made a mistake, they start to believe that's who they are. And so your behavior now becomes the reference of your identity. 
And that's exactly where a lot of Christians get stuck, not recognizing that your behavior, the fact that there is still a lack in your maturity does not define who you are. You have a different identity, and that identity is established in Christ. It's something that has happened. It is past tense. I have become a new creature, creation in Christ. Now, for us to, to understand this, um, let's just look at these three dimensions each separately. The first one is when the, when the Bible speaks about the fact that we have been saved have been saved, it, it's this wonder of us being included in the initiative of God, in the glorious redemptive act of Jesus Christ, and we put our faith in that reference, and something happens in our lives. Listen to what Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 says, for by grace... You have been saved. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You have been saved. What does that mean? It means something happened here within your spirit man. Remember, you are. Spirit, soul, and body. And something happens here within us when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, how do we do that? Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what happens? You will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When we recognize that that which Jesus did on the cross has a bearing on my life, and I receive that in faith, the Bible says something happens. I am saved. And what happens when I am saved? Well, I move from darkness to light. I move from death to life. Something happens in my life. It is a transformation that happens. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul explains that to us. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, now putting his faith in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Hey, hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, let me quickly ask you, for those online and those that are here today, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and that you've put your faith in Jesus Christ? Would you raise your hand and shout amen? amen. Well, the Bible says you have been saved. You have been saved. Now, why is, this, why is this so important? Is that you will have no fear in the day of judgment. That you will have no fear about the future. That you don't fear death. Why? Because you know something has happened within you and you are saved. The fact that you do things that are wrong is not what defines you. What defines you is what you have become. You have become a new creation in Christ. Now, what does that new creation look like? And what does it mean? Well, we read about that in Romans 8 verse 28. Listen 
or 29, listen to what Scripture says to us. For whom he foreknew, this is God having all the knowledge, he predestined, he predestined. You have been destined to be conformed to the image of the Son so that he might be the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. Listen to what he says. He says, listen, God had this plan that in salvation, you will be brought to a place where you will be conformed. Your life will be so transformed that you will be conformed to the very image of the Son because He is the first amongst this new group of people. This word first is the word proto. Now, uh, we get our, our, our word prototype from this word. It really means the original regarding specifications, right? So if you build anything, if they build a vehicle, what do they do? They first build a prototype. And then they develop the whole assembly line to re replicate and reflect the original proto. So everything that happens in this journey is now that Finally, when the car gets to the end of the assembly line, it looks exactly to the very specification of the original proto. And they will only sign that car off if it looks exactly the same. You can't have some bright spark engineer in the middle of this process say, no, but I actually think, you know, I come from a certain area where we like to have lights under the car and, you know, drop the chassis and perhaps put a few fins on it and, you know, change, let's change this thing. You can't do that. They're not going to sign off on it. Why? Because that's the idea of having a prototype. The prototype defines that which will be following. And this is exactly what the Bible tells us. Jesus Christ is our prototype and you have been now aligned to who he is. That's amazing. That's the good news. You are no longer defined by Adam. You see, that's exactly what has happened in salvation. Something happens deep within us where the very image of Christ now finds opportunity and starts to define who I am. But now, I have to bring alignment. And this is my soul dimension. This is where my will, my intellect, my emotions are. And we all know that many times that dimension of our lives is not yet aligned to the very reference of our true identity in Christ. But the problem is, when people live in that space and they are disappointed with themselves and, and what they're doing, they immediately think, well, that's who I am. That is not who you are. That's the important thing. That's the story of the good news. Your behavior does not define your identity. It's time for you to recognize that your identity needs to affect your behavior. That's the process. That's the story of salvation. And so the second part is where we start to speak about being saved. Now, this being saved is where we grow to maturity. This is where we start to recognize who we are. And because we recognize that actually I have been transformed 
to the very image of Christ. Now the question is, how does that find expression through my life? And this is what James, one of the fathers of the church, is now writing to the early church. And when he writes to the church, he realizes that many of them are still struggling with certain things in their behavior. And now he's encouraging them to step away from that lifestyle, step away from that way of thinking, step away from allowing their old way of thinking and functioning to determine how they live. And he's encouraging them to embrace a new reference. And listen to what he writes in James 1 verse 21 he says therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness with a willingness that's what meekness means a willingness to to embrace this he says receive with meekness what the implanted word that which now defines who you are because if you can accept that there is something within you that is different what will it do it is able to save your souls being saved i have been saved I'm a new creation in Christ. But now that I'm a new creation in Christ, I'm in a process of being saved. And this being saved means I am growing to become who I actually already am. I need to give expression to who my new identity is defining who I really am. And this is the key. Now he says, this is the way it works. He says, don't just be a hearer of this word. He says, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. What do you see when you look in a mirror? You see yourself, right? He says, now you're looking at who you are, but you go away and you immediately forget what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in all that he or she does. You see, there's a mirror. And this mirror is called the Word. And who is the Word? It's Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and this Word became flesh. He came to show us how we can live in a totally new way. And now, as we put our faith in Christ, what happens? The very Word of God finds opportunity in our lives, and it transforms us in our inner man. And now Christ, the very life of Christ, dwells in in me no longer is it I that live Paul says but Christ now lives in me there's a new reference to my life there's a new definition to my life I my true identity is now Christ and now as I look into the mirror well, this is the most beautiful thing that you can think of. You know, there's another reference in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where it says, as we look as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What do you see when you look in this mirror? You see glory. You see Christ. You see another reference of your life. That's what you need to start seeing, that when you look into that mirror, you discover the very 
character of Christ, the very nature of Christ is now giving definition to who you are. You say, but I don't feel that way. It's because you're not looking into the mirror as deeply as you should. Because the more you look into the mirror, the more you see Christ, the more you discover who you really are. He's the prototype of who you are. And as you discover that, it reframes your thinking about who you are. Why is this important? Because identity precedes activity. The way you see yourself determines how you live. Everything you do, every interaction you have with people, the way you live life is an outflow of how you think about yourself. And if you have the wrong reference about who you are, it affects everything in your life. And this is why it's so important for us to understand that the, the measure of our lives is a reflection now of how deeply I understand my true identity in Christ. You know, maturity in Christ if you are a Christ follower, but you're, you're living constantly in an immature way, you're allowing th things of this world to govern the way you function. I'm not speaking about making mistakes. We all make mistakes. We all have, have, have moments where we recognize, oh, goodness, I should never have done that. I shouldn't have said this. I shouldn't have gone there. I, I, I just I made a mistake. We recognize that happens. Why? Because we're still on the journey. We are being saved. But here's what's very important. Your victories need to become more than your failures. That is the measure of your maturity when you start moving in the direction of recognizing that who you are is Christ manifested through your life. That growth, that development, the renewing of your mind, the spiritual and emotional maturity. And then Scripture says, it says, not only have we been saved, not only are we being saved, it says, but we look towards the future where there will be a day where every limitation and everything that has kept us from living in the fullness of Christ will be transformed and this mortal body will make place for immortality and we will be transformed in a moment when the trumpet sounds. We will be saved. This is good news. This is all good news. You see, having been saved, Christ is now in me. That's good news. Being saved, well, it's, it's no longer from a point of judgmental condemnation. It's now from a desire to become who I truly am so that I can live in this victorious life. This is good news. But there's also this anticipation of this glorious moment. And when John writes about this, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, he says the following. He says, Beloved, now we are children of God. It's not been revealed what we shall be, exactly how this is all going to find expression. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <laughs> Well, I mean, this is incredible. There's going to be a moment in history where everything is going to be transformed and we will be as He is. Just think about that for a minute. It's going to even be beyond what you now experience as having been saved. 
the life, this new life of Christ. And I mean, it's so, so beautiful to see when people come to Christ and how their lives are transformed. And suddenly they see this newness of life and how it affects everything in their lives. And, and then to see them grow and, and become what God has intended them to be. But ultimately, we recognize we are in this process where it will have a final moment and everything will be transformed and we forever will be with Christ. Just listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. This body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And then a little later in that same chapter, he says, For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this more Mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up into victory. What makes this story so beautiful is the moment you start this journey in Christ brings you into salvation. And the concept of salvation, the Greek word sozo or soteria, those two concepts come from the same root word that literally means nothing missing, nothing lacking. We have been saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved so that there will be nothing missing, nothing lacking. This is the good news of the gospel. And, and, and here's the encouragement. Don't get confused here in the middle where you are being saved. That you miss the deep understanding of the fact that you have been saved. And what that means in your life. And the fact that we will be saved. And the, the incredible reference that, that that holds in your life. And it's in this tension that we now live, being saved. And many times when we are here, we lose sight of the big picture of what salvation really means. And so as the band comes up, I want to point you just to this understanding that we are in this progressive journey. We're, we're on this journey the fact that we, that we now grapple with issues of our own maturity does not define the incredible glory of the fact that we have already been saved and have a new identity. And that there is this glorious eternity that defines this concept of salvation. Listen to what Philippians 1.6 says. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's this progressive understanding and seeing and becoming what God has intended for our lives. And so here's the challenge for you, whether you're online or here this morning, it starts by being saved. It starts with you coming to the point where you recognize Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and that he is Lord of all. And if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, his blood becomes real in your life and it cleanses you of all sin and iniquity. It transforms your life and you become a new creation in Christ. Something happens in you. You go from death to life. You go from darkness 
into light, something happens in your life. And if that has not yet happened in your life, today is your day. Today is the day where you can respond and say yes to that incredible invitation to embrace salvation. Or maybe you find yourself that you are a Christ follower and that you've made that decision and, and, and that you've recognized that moment of transformation in your life. But you, you're struggling in terms of certain patterns and certain things in your life to experience victory. And somehow in that journey, even that has affected how you think about yourself as a Christ follower, as a Christian, in terms of your identity, in terms of who you actually are. And it's eroding this conviction of who you are in Christ. And so today I pray that enlightenment will come into your life, that you will know that's not who you are. You died to your old life. You were baptized. It's a symbol of, of being buried. And you were raised into newness of life with Jesus Christ. And so the fact that that pattern has not been broken means that you have to look deeply into the perfect law of liberty so that you can once again discover who you truly are, so that you can break that cycle in the name of Jesus, so that you can start living the victorious life that you were destined to live. This is the good news. So, that you together with millions of people all across this world can anticipate the day, that day, that glorious day, day when Jesus will return and he will come and make all things new and we will see him as he is and we will become as he is and, and we will transition into this newness of life where in this process of salvation in Embracing our identity and growing in our maturity will ultimately in eternity be the fulfillment of this good news, the gospel of salvation. So allow me to just pray for you today. Wherever you are in this journey, will you just receive right now? Just receive and say, Lord, I thank you for salvation. Oh, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we say, thank you for salvation. Thank you that we've entered into this transforming power that has come and made us new. That now we are those that carry the very life of Christ within us. We thank you, Lord, as we navigate our maturity, as we navigate this, this growing and, and becoming that which you have intended us to be, that, that we would continue to look back to this implanted word, this mirror, this reference that defines our lives so that we can break the lies that we can break free from that which keeps us captive because we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We thank you. And Lord, we, as your people, truly today, just in a fresh and new way, we say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We look forward to that day when your return will bring full transformation and this mortal will be transformed to immortality. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news message. We thank you for salvation. Be glorified, Lord Jesus, in and through our lives and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Amen.